Welcome to the Copy Closer Podcast. I've got my main man, Adilo Marcy. I believe I pronounced his name right. He said I did, but I don't know. He's the fucking man. It's uh, so funny. The reason I keep saying he's the man is because uh, he's not only a, a great copywriter, we're going to find out about his history, and he's got a really amazing story that's completely unique. I haven't heard anyone else. A lot of us have a very similar story of either stumbling into it through sales or whatever. He's got a really cool, unique story, so it'll be interesting to hear it. And uh, uh, we'll talk about some cool copywriting strategies. But first, what's up, man? Thank you for coming on the show. Dude, thank you so much for having me on here. Like, as soon as I saw you put this up, I was like, shit, I got to be on that show. I love this guy. <laughs> Dude, you're the fucking man. So uh, for the folks who, who don't know, can well, actually, for the folks who don't know who you are, is it okay if they follow you on Facebook? Hells yes. You guys can definitely hit me up on Facebook. Just uh, find me up at Adel Amarcy. Uh, if I've got like a full billing list of like 5,000 people, just hit follow. You'll get like a shitload of my updates. They're usually weird and fun. Nice. Nice. Nice, nice. Okay, so uh, first off, guys, if you get your phone or whatever, you can go. You can keep listening to the podcast and go ahead and follow on Facebook. But I want to start with your story. Let's kind of start with where you came from. How you even? I mean, was there a time where usually people can't say they weren't just out the womb writing copy, except for you? I think I don't know. So <laughs> was there a time you weren't writing copy? And what were you? If there was, what were you doing, dude? What's your uh, origination story type deal? My my uh, my uh, my. My origin story, man. This is kind of a fun one. And I love the fact that you cued me up so perfectly for this because it makes me giggle. Um, so for everyone that doesn't know who I am, basically I've, uh, so I'm turning 30 in September of 2019 to give you guys an idea. I'm not, I'm not even 30 yet. I am technically a veteran when it comes down to it simply because October 3rd, 2019 marks my 18th year as a copywriter and my 12th year as a professional. So the way that I actually really got into it was my, uh, my dad was paralyzed from the waist down for two years when I was five till seven years old. So five, six, and seven for those two years, uh, my dad was paralyzed from the waist down. Now, for the people that aren't hardcore psychology nerds like us, or if you are, you should totally know about this, that your brain actually doesn't develop its personality until it hits seven years old. It's all unconscious gray matter until then. I kind of lucked out that my dad had a weird obsession. And his weird obsession was he loved watching three TV shows, I almost constantly, it, it was fascinating to me as a kid. It annoyed the shit out of me as a kid, but it was fascinating as I look back on it. The first one is a show called Countdown. If you're not British and you've never seen the show, I recommend you just watch the funny version, which is eight out of 10 cats does Countdown. Um, but essentially what it is, it's a words and numbers game. You have nine letters and then you got to make up like the highest count letter or word you can based on what's shown in front of you. And then you have like a numbers round. So numbers and words were kind of like a thing that kind of happened in my brain. The other was like a really random trivia show that's no longer on air called 15 to Wait, 1. you have numbers and words is a thing for you? Isn't it normally people are numbers or words? You're like, oh, no, I'm just a numbers and words guy, meaning I just know everything. And science. Oh yeah. And science. And science? What the fuck? Dude, I studied no human way. bio like quite a high level and human psychology. This fucking guy. Okay, yeah. keep going. I'm glad if you're on the show. Ever went through, I'm glad you're on the show. I went through the crazy shit that I'm into in my spare time. You're like, what, what the hell? Who is this guy? <laughs> All right, keep going on. I, this I is why I'm still single. It was fascinating. I was, like, I was gonna say I was gonna say this is probably why I'm still single because no one believes me when they go, Wait, you do what? I was like, Yeah, exactly. But anyway, back to it. So my dad had the very sad thing that he loved to watch. And this is the thing that really kind of um, amalgamated and glued everything together for me. And that was uh, my dad loved watching the Home Shopping Channel, specifically Billy Mays. And you got to realize my dad watched this shit for two hours a day, six days a week for two years. Now, if you imagine that your brain is unconscious gray matter and that's going into your head all the time, guess what you're going to understand how to do? Now, couple that in with the fact that I'm naturally an extrovert. I love being around people. I love talking to people and I really get people. It's one of my favorite things to do is just like be around other humans. Around eight years old, and this is a side story. This is kind of like the earliest I remember it. I was eight years old and I remember doing this because I used to wait for, and for the kids. I don't think there's any kids listening out there, but if you have kids, make sure they don't run this play on you. If they do, high five them because they totally deserve a medal. Um, I used to go to my mom when she was on the phone and I'd ask her when she was talking to my aunt if I could play on my PlayStation. And this is usually when my cousin's over or I have my sister like trying to watch something that I don't want to watch. I'll just go ask my mom because mom supersedes every authority. 
So I'd wait for her to be on the phone and just badger the shit out of her. <laughs> can't play on PlayStation, can't play on PlayStation, can't play on PlayStation. She used to get annoyed and be like, yeah, go play on your PlayStation. Just, you know, leave me alone. So I'd run off and play on my PlayStation. And then everyone hated me. And one day my mom, like, caught him on to this and was like, you know what, you're a, you're a manipulator. I was like, wait, what? She was like, yeah, you're a manipulator. So I just laughed and smiled. I was like, that's cool. I, I had no idea what the hell a manipulator was. I was like, this is cool. I, I, I guess that's a good thing. Fast forward to me at 12 years old. My dad obviously is walking in. And uh, my, my teacher pulls my parents aside like before I go to, uh, I think it's like middle school? Is it like when you're about 12? Is that middle school? Yeah, it's middle school. Yeah. So it's my first year at middle school. Uh, but before I go there, I'm sitting there at um, what we call junior school. And I remember like um, going to a little primary school for us. I remember going to uh, uh, like uh, this parent evening. My parents were being told by my teacher, hey, your son's really, really clever. Like he's really creative. He's very talented. The problem is that he's very pedantic about how he writes. He's very slow. And my parents are like, what do you mean? He goes, when he gets down, to, uh, I am a perfectionist. This is one of the reasons why I'm very grateful that they tested me for badges because I might have passed for it, uh, for it because I used to write a full page of whatever it was I was writing. If I got to the very end and I misspelled a single word or if I put a full stop in the wrong place, like it was slightly below or above the line, or it just didn't look right in my brain, I'd tear the page out and start again. Oh, my God. Like, I could be on the last word of that page. It could take me four hours to write that damn page. But I'd tear it out and start again. And my parents were like, uh, yeah, this is not going to fly at, at, at middle school. You need to. My teacher's like, he needs to do something. So my dad uh, had a little company back then. And he decided that he was going to get me to come in and write stories for him every day. I don't care what it is about. Just write a story. This at so 12 I'd, years old? 12 years old, write stories about whatever's in front of you, write stories about the pens, write stories about the artwork, write stories about the stuff that we do, which is important, exporting things over back and forth from Africa, just write about whatever, like machine, machinery you can get your hands on, just whatever. I was like, cool. So I did this for about a couple of months, and then uh, my parents separated when I was 13 uh, for about two years. In that time, my school commute to, uh, my, to my middle school went from about 40 minutes, like 30, 40 minutes each way, so we'll say 30 minutes on average because if I was walking fast, I'd get them 20 minutes. If I was walking slow, I'd get them 40 minutes. So about 30 minutes a day would be my walking time. Um, when my parents separated, I moved to a neighborhood that was so far away from my school. It was a two, it was a one hour bus trip each way to get to school and back. And being the extroverted kid I was, I would have loved to talk to people, but my self-esteem was completely shot. So I couldn't speak to anyone. So I used to have my head down, have a notepad with me and used to write. Up until, up until this point, I was an artist. I used to love drawing. Like, you've seen, like, if you've seen some of my Facebook stuff lately, I've been posting more and more my, my digital artwork, like frameworks I've been working on and stuff like that, just simply because it's for me. I, don't, I, I couldn't care less if someone wanted to buy it. It's just something that is a release for me. Um, around that time, I started focusing more and more on my writing. But my dad always kept up, even when I was doing martial arts, even when I got into music, no matter what How I did. How much did you do? Uh, Thai boxing. I was a, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I used to I, teach Thai boxing. Sweet. Yeah, I uh, I still do from time to time. I still teach Thai boxing from time to time now, but I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu more so. Um, oh, so you'd fuck me up now, because you know once we go to the ground, the ground it's like, like oh, well, I play well, cucaracha, <laughs> man. I play cockroach. <laughs> <laughs> it would just be to be fair. We'd probably have a blast when we meet up. Anyway, I'll take you to a Jiu Jitsu class when I'm out there, and just be like, oh, this is my boy. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll roll under the influence and see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> so much more fun. Anyway, so back at this point, so I'm doing Thai boxing. Uh, I'm playing basketball. I'm like, at this point as well, I stopped drawing because my art teacher pissed me off. So I started to like go into other creative realms. So I got into music. I started producing hip hop records for my friends. Um, yeah. Like, I don't sound you like produce I'm. produce these hip hop records? What do you mean you produce them? Like you had all the equipment and all that stuff and. My school did. So you what? My school did. Oh, you're. <laughs> that's so smart. <laughs> so I'd go into the school and I'd like just pick up beats. Like I'd make beats or I'd find instrumentals to songs that were really good. And then my friends would come over and we would record them at my place. Um, hmm. And I just sent them MP3s and stuff. And it was, you know, just screwing around. There was nothing really serious about it. It was just having fun and enjoying what was there. Like I was never great at it. I'll just put this out there. I was terrible at this. 
it was just something I did for fun. Like just like everything in my life, I do it for fun and it's usually terrible, but it's fun. How long did you do it for? About two, three years. <laughs> That's not like dabbling, dude. That's okay. Continue. Continue. It wasn't this continuous. Is... I took more time playing basketball than I did like anything else. That's the reason I still have my basketball with me now. Um, but like all this time, I'm still training. I'm still doing all these other different things. And the gift that I was given was I don't sleep very much. I sleep like now as I've gotten older, I sleep maybe five or six hours a night. Back then I was sleeping three or four. Like three or four hours, I'd be like running right out. Like, like my schedule, I'd start my schedule at like 5.30 in the morning. I'd go running. I'd get back, have a shower, get ready for school, go to school, uh, play basketball after school, then go straight to the gym, work out till about 9, 10 o'clock at night, get back home, eat something, do my homework, speak to people on MSN, and go to bed. And I'd start this shit up every single day. That's basically- Have like, you always like, been like this? Yeah. For the like, most part? For the most part of my life, I've always been like, I have to do something. If, if I'm doing absolutely nothing, I feel like I'm wasting time. It's the weirdest thing. Like some people go, well, you should really learn how to sit still. I'm like, I can't. You don't get how my brain. It, it's the reason why I'm talking to people. I have to have something in my hands. Or I have to look out the window. Because if I start looking at someone's face for too long, I start analyzing their face. and start picking up shit that they don't want me to pick up. I'm like, God damn, this is really bad. I don't, I don't think they want me to know that. But anyway, back at it around this time. And we're getting to the reason why this is all there. Uh, around this time, fast forward to the time I'm 18. Now I've been um, writing all this entire time, giving in my dad, like giving my dad all these books every single week of like different stories I've been writing just for him to use whatever he wants. I'm 18 years old, and surprisingly, the person we spoke about earlier, he and I met at an event when I was 18 years old. Fast forward one year, we're at another event where I'm actually uh, crewing for this company. It's the second time in the UK, that, and the second time is speaking. So, like 2009, 2000, yeah, 2008, 2009. Um, up until this point, I was in an MLM company and me and my upline fell out. So, this is a couple of months after that. I remember going to this event. I remember him and two other people, I'm not mentioning names for a very specific reason. We sat down and they asked me, What are you really good at? And I said, Well, I'm not great at traffic getting, but I wrote a blog post and 10 people saw it and seven of them bought. And I was beating myself up because I thought that was a terrible number. I was like, I know it's not great and stuff. And they were like, they were just sat there like, what the hell's wrong with you? It's 70%. What the, shut up. They were like, you're a copywriter. Go out there and sell your services. People will hate tens of thousands of dollars for this stuff. I was like, cool. But I had like so little self-esteem, I couldn't charge that much. But this was at 18 years old? 18, 19. Yeah, so just, 18, time, just, so just shortly after I turned 19. And these are some people at an MLM company that told you that? No, this is uh, our mutual friend. That oh, for me. yeah. So he, uh, he basically was one of the people that actually pushed me forward. And I always will thank him for this. Um, so as time goes on, I start working in door to door sales. So I start studying John Carlton. I start studying Gary Halbert. And Gary said that a really good salesman should be able to sell in every level. Like every great copywriter has done sales at every level. So I was like, okay, screw it. I'm going to go do door to door sales. I did door to door sales. I did, uh, I did telesales. I did like email drops. And then while I'm all doing this, I'm also going to like different networking events. I'm trying to meet new people, trying to get clients. And someone passes my name on to this real estate company in the UK. Now this real estate company does trainings every single year. And their whole promise was inside the space of one year, we will actually get you, we will triple your investment back. Now the investment was 15,000 pounds, right? It's 15 grand and the outcome will be 45. I signed a deal with them and they paid me three grand plus 3%, I think it was for the first week's take. Ridiculously great money for a kid that's 19 years Absolutely. old. Absolutely. So you're Actually, still 18, 19 years old at this time doing door to door and all this stuff. At yeah. The, right. Okay. Yeah. So like I signed the deal at 19. I didn't, I didn't end up handing it in until I was 20, 20 because it was only uh, it was eight weeks and my birthday was in between. So I turned 20 when I handed it in, um, well, a month after. I remember like sitting down and writing this ad and thinking this is the worst piece of garbage I've ever, like, I've ever written, but I have no idea anything better. And of course, my dyslexia is kicking my ass. So like, there's spelling errors everywhere. So I had to have an editor come in and go through it. I remember mailing it in and just to give you an idea. Back then, I was writing sales funnels, like full funnels, front to, uh, like end to end, for like 500 bucks, and I'd have it handed in the next morning. Like, nice. I, was like, I would write an entire sales funnel overnight and mail it in the next day. 
That's unbelievable. Yeah, Instead I of really, like a month. I really wish I still had that ability now, but like, dear Lord, back then it was amazing. It's like, oh shit, that wow. happened. Here you go, done. <laughs> Stay up all night, Jeff, done. Anyway, um, around this time, I started developing other skills like in web development, like membership site building. Like, I can still knock out a membership site in about two hours. Like, you give me what I need, I'll get a membership site up and ready for you in two hours. Piss easy to do. Um, especially, you know, the integration, in- integration of everything. Anyway, so as we're going down this uh, pathway and coming down this way, I end up going to, uh, I end up getting this whole mailing thing going out and I'm still doing door to door sales, but right now I'm on the negative. Uh, I'm not making zero money. I've got like two and a half grand in debt, um, which is a lot back then for me because I had no idea how I was going to get out. Because back then, I think like 20 grand a year was like good money. <laughs> like now I look at 20 grand a year and I go, wow, that is so not good money. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, no, of course. So the hustlers that are making just 20 grand right now know that if you keep moving forward, that number will, ri- will rise. But for me back then, it was, it was a lot of money. I remember um, getting a phone call from the credit card company chasing me down, asking me for money. And I was like, holy crap. I was in the field. I really need, didn't want to affect my, my, my mood. I was like in such a really like anxious state. And, and the desperation is real. When you're trying to sell because you know you need the money to eat, yeah, that desperation really kicks in. And I was lucky because I was living at home still. Uh, I was living with my parents. But it wasn't a lot of fun. I'm not going to lie. It sucked. My dad kept like kicking my ass about it going, why do you think you can actually do this and go get a real job, that kind of thing. And just a side note to kind of go back a little bit because there is a bit of my story I did miss, which is basically when I came home and told my dad I was going to be a copywriter, that was the one thing he did for me. He went upstairs and showed me a black uh, file full of old ads and goes, read these. I read through them by a third one goes, do you recognize them? I was like, these sound like the stories I used to write for you. He goes, yeah, we used to take your stories, give them to our copywriters and get them to mail out. They used to like just edit the headline and clean up your grammar and then put a close at the end and send it out, which is why I say I've been writing for 18 years, but professionally for only 12. That's, that's amazing, dude. So you were writing stories at 12 years old. That were getting clients. That were and, getting clients and they are being put into ads and shit. Yeah, That's I just didn't. I had no fucking clue about it though. Anyway, so back to this point, I remember being. Uh, I think it was like I was in door to door sales, and this is like my first real big win. I remember getting a phone call from my bank, um, asking me if I could make a payment that day for like 120 pounds. I had like zero money. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah I'll do my best because I was like, bullshit it. I'll make a couple of sales. Money will come in my bank. I'll be able to pay. Whatever. I remember going to. Um, I remember getting off the phone. I'm getting a text message from my client going, hey, first week is done. Um, expect your payment to be cleared soon. P.S. I think you'll be very happy. I was like, oh, cool. Money in my bank. Pay off my debts. I think the most I thought I made was like five grand. I legit thought I only made, like I barely broke even how much they paid me. I thought, eh, five grand, whatever. I got off the fucking phone with them get a phone call from my bank verifying who I am because the amount of money seems suspicious <laughs> for a 19 slash 20 year old kid. I basically made, I was 20 at the time. So for a 20 year old kid, I made my client about 3.5 million pounds that week. One week. That's not the whole campaign. Just that one week I had access to. And I took home around 80,000 pounds that week. Wow. They basically put 80 grand in my account, changed overnight. The problem was I was really stupid and had the, the internal temperature of like having how much money. Obviously, I blew all that money. I wish I could say it was on something like drugs and hookers and stuff and cars. In reality, I was just paying off other people's debts the entire time. That, that's basically all I did. And then, you know, ever since then, I kind of like moved forward and write, wrote ads for so many people. And, um, the biggest lesson I learned was never to actually focus on one niche. Just get really good at what you do and write for as many markets as possible and find the ones that you'd like to write for. But if, you, if you're comfortable in many areas, you'll always be able to get hired. You'll always be able to actually work with someone. That's interesting. I love that because a lot of people will tell you to niche down into one area and, and whatnot. But I've always thought the same thing. I mean, I've written in tons of different niche markets yeah. and there's some I definitely would rather not write in. So I just stay away from them. But, you know, it's not that much different, especially if you're going to give it your all and put all the real research in and put all the, you know, if you're really giving it your all, just like, 
you know, some people say, and I used to say it too, actually, that financial copy was harder to write. And it's definitely hard to write for me because I'm just not interested in that as much, exactly. right? Yeah. But I, the, the copy is still, you know, 6,000, 10,000 words, right? The same copy for a great long form personal development letter will be about the same amount of 6,000, 10,000 words. I mean, length and copy wise, it doesn't really change much. So you can write in tons of different niche markets. And one of the things that's great is, and let me know what you think on this, obviously, is you can take the, you know, what you learned in one and then just apply it in another one. It may be revolutionary. I think Jay Abraham used to talk about stuff like exactly. that. Yeah. He calls it cross pollination and it works perfectly. It's one of the things that um, I agree with. And Jay Abraham was one of my heroes. I'm kind of lucky that he ended up becoming one of my clients. That's uh, that insane. He became one of your clients. Yeah. I mean, like um, his company did. So That's fucking got, cool. So he that did. Yes. That, that, was, that, was, that was pretty awesome last year. Uh, but what I was going to say was, as far as it goes with like the whole thing with like Jay, Gary, John, John Carlton, this is uh, Gary Ben Svenger as well, um, as well as Halbert, they were gunslingers back in the day. They didn't care what market you wrote for. They would write for it and get money coming in because they knew they could do it. And for me, that's what I worked up to. And there is a framework, in my opinion, that like I used to have this belief up until about last year where I used to believe that every sales that for it to be good had to follow a very certain framework. Um, and it's one that I've consistently used because uh, unconsciously I use this because when I consciously came to the conclusion of what it was, I'd made my clients about $350 million in trackable sales in about eight years. In the three years that followed after that, we did, uh, we got to 500 million. So we did $150 million of sales in three years after I figured out what the system was for myself. That's fucking just insane. fucking bonkers yeah <laughs> right, right now one of my clients and this is one of, this are you going to share this with us maybe i'll share bits share, of it. share some share, of it share some of it. it it's i'll <sighs> give you the biggest point is of like where things go it, it's not so much the formulate process of like oh you need to say this except for there is one thing that you and i both know that i'm still taking claim as the king of coming up with it that's um, right closing yay but the one that really uh, works, it's, it's the structure of the letter that actually goes in place. When you have things put in a certain structure, they convert better because it's more of a conversation. And um, we're going to jump on that in just a second. But one of the things I really learned from those guys was if you get really good, because the, the, a lot of people make you believe there's only two levels. There's a specialist, which is shit. There's a, and then there's, the, sorry, there's a generalist, which is shit. And then there's a specialist and the specialist is the niche guy that's like known for this one market. That's a level above that. It's called level three. Level three is known as a specialized generalist, meaning you can write about anything and you'd be fucking gold with it. <laughs> and that's what it comes down to. So as per your request, I'll tell you the biggest thing. I won't tell you the, uh, we'll, we'll cover the closing thing in a second, but I'll tell you the uh, biggest thing for me that most people screw up on. You guys better be taking notes. I know I am. Uh, bonuses. Where people place their bonuses is the worst possible place. So let me ask you, not, not saying just you, but from what you've seen, where would you say most people put their bonuses? I know I just put mine at the end. Right? Because you're smart. You're not dumb. And I mean that in the most nicest way to everyone else that doesn't do this. A lot of people put their bonuses um, right after they actually detail the product. Like they'll detail what the product is and then give you the bonuses. You know, you're very right about that. I never yeah. even paid attention to that. You're very right about that. Yeah, a lot of people do that. They have this weird ability um, from, I, I, ca I caught this on, like, I think it was like 22 when I caught onto this because uh, the only person I saw do it differently was Frank Kern. And Frank put his bonuses at the start of his sales letter. And th like, if you have a, one of my favorite sales letters, if you can find it, it's a video, it's amazing. Uh, it's Frank Kern's Mass Control 2.0 sales letter. It is the greatest, in my opinion, one of the greatest VSLs you will ever see. Um, because it's Frank and it's in his surfer dude days that everyone fucking loves. Um, and one of the coolest things he said was at the very start, so there's been a lot of misconceptions about what Mass Control 2.0 is, but we're going to clear those up in a moment. But before we do that, I want to show you a couple of bonuses. The first one is you're going to receive this big box from me. And the first thing you're going to see is going to be this thing called uh, Watch First, and it's called Core Influence. It's my, and then he goes into this whole what Core Influence is, and then he tells you about the four-day cash machine, 
And he goes, this will help you recoup your investment. So by the time you've actually even got to the opening of understanding what mass control is, you're already sold on the idea that I'll make my money back if I have a mailing list with his magical formula. And also I'll be able to fix the mindset that's actually keeping me broken that should not, not get the results I want. So it's so goddamn powerful. And then he goes into the actual um, telling you what it is, what it works and how it closes. If you're doing this with a traditional sales letter, and the reason why this doesn't work for everyone is because not everyone has Frank's charisma, positioning, and placement. They don't have that level of personality to actually draw that level of, um, of, of fuckery, is a nice way of putting it. He, he, he messes around and it works for him. Same with Jay Abraham. Jay Abraham is like super technical when he writes, um, and he does not write in the 10th, like the fourth or fifth grade language. He doesn't write as a fourth or fifth grader. He writes like a 10th grader. Um, so he <laughs> very, very technical language, which as we all know, as a rule of copywriting, you definitely don't want to do. But Jay breaks the rules and, you know, it works. Frank breaks the rules and it works. These are the exceptions to the rule. The rule is, as you do it, the reason you want to put your bonuses after the guarantee, and that's why I usually put my bonuses after the guarantee. So I have like uh, price reveal, justification, close, bonus a guarantee bonuses reclose sign off and the reason i do it this way is because where the bonuses are when i describe the product i give the testimonials and that should sell like 90 percent of people that are already going to buy that should give them everything they need to know when you get down to the closing when you get, after you've done the close and everything else like that the ones that are kind of like a maybe need to see the bonuses at that point because they've already made a decision whether or not they're a yes or a no or a maybe if they're a maybe they see the bonuses, that should knock them over to a yes. If there are no, those bonuses will knock them over to a maybe. If they're already a yes, these bonuses make them say, double down, hell yes, I don't want a refund. These are really, really powerful little things that people need to be aware of, that they're really not. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second, do you mind if I jump into the whole close thing? Because this. No, is no, definitely. If you don't mind, talk up just a little bit louder so oh, folks sorry. can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, there we go. Sorry. Perfect. Oh yeah. Sorry, I moved for a second. Um, so I was gonna say. Come on, man! Don't move. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So we're gonna. I'm gonna stay here. I'm not allowed to look stay, away. Just be frozen. <laughs> like this, just action, Jackson. Uh, but no, what I was gonna say was. Um, so as far as it goes with the closing, which is one of my favorite things ever to do. By the way, I'm now paranoid whether or not you can hear me. No, 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 I could hear you before. It was just like when you drop it down, you just have to scream a little bit so we can hear you oh, okay. a little. So now you can actually hear me. Okay. So I'll just wait. Yeah, no, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're great. All right, cool. So just with get... the idea of, I'll just act like I'm talking to the person three rows behind. There's no one else here, but we'll go with that. <laughs> um, fictional. Yay. Anyway, so as far as it goes with closing, I'm glad that you used this because I remember we had that very cool uh, phone call. I think it was five of us that were on that phone call. I remember telling you, telling you guys about it. You're the only one that I know that does use this. And uh, it's a very specific close that I actually want to say that I invented. I'm pretty sure I did because I told Mark Joyner this, and Mark Joyner's response was, holy shit, you went under the credit card tri uh, trip. Why didn't you? You figured it out. It it's simple. Um, it's four words. And realistically, your whole sales letter, a lot of people have this whole thing where you're like supposed to twist a knife and make people feel pleasure and pain and yada, yada, yada. Here's the long and short of it. You want to get good at writing copy, here's the dead simple secret. Remove as much fear as possible between your product and the person. Remove as many barriers of fear. If you get down to the close, most people fuck this up, they will sell from their heels. They will pussyfoot around the close because they don't want people to get mad at them. You want to get around that, you tell them what to do. And you tell them what's going to happen. And here it is. This is how memorized it is. Here's what you do next. Click the order button. You'll be taken to a secure checkout page or billing page where all you have to do is enter your regular details or billing details as Carlos likes to use and complete your investment today. Once you've done so, and I've evolved this a little bit, once you've done so, you'll be sent an email within 15 minutes with an invoice and your login information. On the next page after, you just need to register your email to confirm that you're the right person. After which, you'll be able to get started in as little as 15 minutes. Dead. Ooh, see, I didn't have all that. That's some that's some extra shit right here. Oh yeah, no, it goes it goes deep. And the reason I do this is because when you go through that, it doesn't trigger any warning in someone's mind, and it completely diffuses the idea of what if I click this link and I get scammed? What if I click this link and I don't go to an order page? What if? What if? What if? It removes all of this and leaves you with a core fucking basics of this works. This is that great. 
That's all it is. What do you think about, because now you're giving me some more ideas. So what do you think about if you're doing this, I guess you could do it either as a sales page or a VSL, but saying all that, but then including like screenshots of like the email that they're going to get, here's what the thing is going to look like. Now you're two or three steps ahead, which I love because I do this for webinars. And the way I do this for webinars is I actually have my clients have a separate, like first of all, I get them to completely um, clear, if they're on a Mac, there's, a, there's an app that you can use that basically clears out your desktop. Like it just shows a blank desktop. Like you just click it, you toggle it, you don't have a messy desktop anymore. And what I do is I let them have a private browser open with three tabs. Tab number one is the post webinar sales page. Tab number two is the order page. Tab number three is the welcome portal for the training. Not the thank you page, but the welcome portal. What I get my clients to do is I get them to click off my actual uh, webinar. So it'll be something along the lines of this. So here's what you do next. Click this link or go to this URL. It could be something as simple as the copyright, or was it, what's yours, copyright domination? Uh, The copywriting domination method. Yeah, the copywriting domination uh, method.com. I'll tell people to go to that. And then I would get off the webinar open up my browser where this is preloaded and say, you should see this page. If you're seeing anything else, but this page, go back and type the URL again. Mm -hmm. This way people are like, Oh shit. Yeah. So that keeps people on because it removes fear. The next step is I I walk them through. It's like, here's everything you're getting. I'll scroll down. Here's everything I've already said that you're getting. It's all total here. What you do next. And I hover my mouse over the order button and say, once you click this link, you will be shown this page. As soon as I like say shown this page, I just tab over to the next page, which is the order form. And I'm like, you'll see this page where all you have to do is enter your regular details here, here, and here and complete your investment. The three places I've told them to it, billing information, shipping information, and complete their order. Once I've told them to do those things, click that button. Once you've done so, you'll receive an email in about 15 minutes. Once you've registered your account, you'll see this and I tab over to the freaking welcome, uh, to the welcome portal, like the membership portal. Because now what I've done is I've mentally taken them on the journey of clicking the link to buying. They've already mentally gone there. There is no fear and resistance. The only thing that has to happen now is them to physically make that jump. And guess what? They make that jump. And that's how I basically close so highly on webinars, VSLs, and sales letters. It's removing as much fear as possible. I love how your brain went there. Not a lot of people even think about that, but that's where I, that's where I go to. It's cool that you do that because you, you walk them through. We always want to make things super simple for people to order, but on webinars, what you're doing is not relying on them to be able to go to this website and then from there, just let the website do all the heavy lifting. You actually walk them through on the webinar and say, okay, great. So here's what you go to this website and then you should have a page that looks like this. And then I guess that page, now, for those types of pages, do you primarily do like just testimonials on there? Is that no. a full-on sales page? It's, How does that work? Because they just came off a webinar. It's a hybrid. So all I do, I'll give you guys a quick little formula on it, which isn't my exact copywriting formula, but it's a different one that we use, um, which is basically we have a headline and a subheadline. The headline is, thank you for watching the webinar with me on, and then I'll just tell them what the webinar is about. Like, thank you for watching the copywriters room or the copywriting domination method webinar, um, or whatever you titled it. Um, if you're ready to, and then I'll, I'll re, uh, I'll tell them again. I'll basically, I can't remember the damn word when you tell someone to do something. So I'll just tell them this is the benefit that they're getting in the subhead and then go, instead of like writing the entire story, all they do in that freaking page, you go, I write another headline, like a small headline, sub headline. And all I write in there is like, here's what you're going to be receiving today. And I block off the modules. I block off everything they're getting. And then I just have like some testimonials, but they don't happen until below the order button. So I go, here's everything you're getting today. Here's the price point. Here's the bonuses. Here's the guarantee. Oh, here's the guarantee. Here's the bonuses. Oh, by the way, um, here's some testimonials from people that have already bought from me before with another order button at the end and so on and so forth. I'll scroll down tell them this is everything you're getting, show them the page and just click order button. Cause I want to make it as concise as possible. Cause people have been on a webinar with me. Don't want to re they don't want to listen to the story again. They don't want to hear about how I came to this conclusion. Cause I've told them how on the webinar. 
Now it's just a case of getting them over the hurdle. So that's how I do it with that sales page formula. So if headline- that's, let me just recap that formula to make sure I got it right, because that's such a simple formula that, that actually gives people a way to, to, to get shit done. Like all you have to do right. really now is plug and play. So it's going to be a headline. Thank you for watching whatever webinar sub headline, you know, the benefit. Now, when you say benefit, is that like, here's what you learned on the webinar? Here's what you're going to get because on this product benefit. It, it's more towards like, say, for instance, I'll use one of mine, which is the copywriters room. So I, that sales page is shit, by the way, because I need to rewrite it. But like, hey, when you're writing your own copy, sometimes you're your own worst critic and you forget things. I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> you usually have to get someone else to do it. Yeah. But um, what, I, what I suggest is that if I stole that from a webinar, I'd say, hey, thank you so much for actually checking out the Copywriters Room webinar. Um, and the subheadline would be, if you want to shortcut your ability of writing copy using a structured format that has been proven for, for over 10 years, then read every word below, or then sign up today. Actually, that's the one I'd use. Then sign up today. Instead of read below, I'd say, then sign up today. And then the subheadline would be, here's everything you're getting in the Copywriters Room. And then I'd basically list it out. And that's the, and then the stack essentially, is that what, what we're doing in that point? The little stack? Yeah, we're doing the stack there. And then we're not doing our bonuses yet. We're doing, actually we are doing our bonuses. We're doing our product and then we're doing a uh, stack of bonuses afterwards. And then we're doing our order button and our testimonial, uh, our order button, our guarantee, and then testimonials at the bottom with another order button. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah. So you want to have it set that way. Um, and then of course you have the rest of the format, the formula that you go through. So yeah, that's pretty much how you do webinars and how you do closes and how I keep the close going. Dude. I, okay. So, you know, it's so funny cause we naturally transitioned into this. So normally what I like to do is ask people, you know, okay, you know, here, here's where you were, how'd you transition into stuff and then eventually try to drop it, you know, some really cool golden <laughs> nuggets that are tactical. And then I didn't even get to ask you that stuff cause you already started doing it. I'm already like on my, I'm like two pages of notes and shit here. I'm like, fuck, what was that again? You know? Um, <laughs> So, but I want to talk about what you're doing now because you, you came up in a really cool way in the copywriting world. And I want to know what is that you're doing now? Um, you know, wh wh what are you up to, dude? Oh, okay. So besides, uh, so I relaunched my website, adelamarcy.com. Uh, the podcast is kicking ass, which is great. And I've got to get you on that show as well. because I've What's the name of the podcast? It's uh, Adel Amarcy Unplugged. You have to be a guest on there because I fucking would love to have you as a guest on there. Um, Thank you. I would love it. Oh, fuck yeah, dude. You're awesome. Um, so there's that. I'm also like, so I've got my products as well. The copywriters room, which we're discounting right now. It's, it's nine, nine, set nine, nine, five. I think it is on the website, but it's four, nine, five is how much you're going to retail it for. Um, just use the code word Archer. I would say Carlos, but honestly, I can't create another coupon right now, but Archer. Coupon, yeah. Archer, like because it. I love the show. It's, it's a great show. And what, how do you spell that? Just for, so for some of the dummies. A R C H E R. Okay, good, good, so good. So very similar to like an actual archer with arrows. Right, right, right. Uh, so if you guys put that coupon code in at checkout, you'll get five hundred bucks off. So it'll be four nine five. Um, so I've been working on that. Uh, on top of that, I'm also working with a couple of. I, you know what, dude? My my junior copywriter asked me how many clients we have right now. I tell you that I have fourteen clients at the same time right now. I'm like, what the, how did I get to, fit? how do you, how did you get, how did you, so real quick before we sign your ass off and stuff, now you, you pulled it back in. How did you get 14 clients? Some people are struggling to even get one. Um, What's the secret, man? Honestly, I wish I could tell you, but the actual thing is just reputation and reaching out to people. That's really the truth. I mean, what I love the most, and I want to give you props to this is your fucking little close of asking, so how can we do a deal today or something? I, I can't remember what these <laughs> words were, but that's the way I, I phrase it. Like, how can we work together and what deal can we make? And people are just like, yeah, I want to do this. Um, but the way that we met, the, the key thing that you want to look at more than anything is how we manage our clients. Because that's the big thing. If you have 14 clients, there's 14 separate voices that you've got to keep in your head at the same time, including your own. So that's 15. That's how do you manage that? dead simple. I actually have a system. The system is really simple. I, uh, I used to use notepads for it. Now I just use um, my iPad and iPencil because uh, I'm an Apple fanboy. 
and I will always defend that right. So fuck everyone else that says that you're a fanboy. Of course I am. Because I'm rich now, bitch. We don't use pencils. We use iPads. Exactly. That's how we keep things in the in the hood. But <laughs> you know what? Now, now you said that. Oh fuck's sake! Now, after this call, grab me because I've got something really hilarious to tell you. Um, <laughs> I can say it on air, but it's no value to anyone else. It's just funny for me and you. Uh, but as far as it goes with like with um, how I actually manage all my clients, I actually write down what it is I need to know about them. And then I record their voices because one of my previous careers was I was a voice actor as well. What? So, yeah, dude, I've done so. I, I used to be a chef as well. A lot of people don't understand this. That's what insane. That's just madness. I, I get really bored. Like I used to get to the point where if I didn't have a client, um, any client work to do, I'd go get a job that I hated for like a month to realize how much I hate working for other people and come back and find clients that way. <laughs> It was never about the money. It was always like, I, I lost my entrepreneurial spirit. I know I should go work for someone. I hate this. All right, go back to doing your own thing. All right, um, right, right. But outside of that, the management is that we have all the client, uh, we have the client recordings. I have all the notes that I need for each client. Um, and usually what I do is when I go sit down, I, I never do the thing where I try and write for three clients in the same day. I try and write for each client um, at the same time. Like, uh, not the same time. I try to write one client a day. So if I have one client that I'm thinking about today, let's say it's Carlos, I'm writing for Carlos, I'd get in his voice, I'll get in his state and I'll write for that entire day and then I'll shut off. I'll give myself about 30 minutes and then I'll think about the next client from there on it. Um, so those are important. And that's basically one of the things I'd say. And there was another question I think you wanted to ask me about. Um, I don't know. It was about how you got clients. And then we started talking about how you manage clients. I think it's um, the future of what we, what's happening. Yes, what's, what's going on? What, should, what are some things that we should be paying attention to as okay, marketers so, and copywriters and, and things? Like, where do you see us going? Okay, so we kind of have like a really weird shift right now. Um, and I'm going to get preachy, so I, I, I don't apologize. Fuck it, I don't care. You should listen to this. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make you a lot of money. Um, number one, get really good at telling stories. That's, the, the market's already at the point where storytelling is kind of like the big key differentiator that is the big lever between worlds um the second thing which is really important pay attention to ai ai is on the way up and john benson if you haven't already i know you're going to have him on the show at some point john speak to him about this that dude, that dude is hella clever about this and um yeah he, he ai he's spearheading that stuff like cool. Ooh, are we gonna have like ai writing copy huh kind of Kind of. I'm not going to spill the bat. I'm not going to spill the beans because I don't know how much um, John. I don't know how much John is actually putting out there. But I'll say this much: what he's already doing with Copy Pro, like one, on how he's basically using. Uh, so you know how we got funnel scripts and funnel hacking and all the other, like script doll. What? So I'm going to set him up perfectly for this. What he's about to do is on a whole different level, which I'm not going to talk about. But he is when you speak to him, try and get him to actually say yes or no to this because he's brilliant. Uh, but the future is definitely heading towards who tells the better story and how can you actually use AI to actually use your templates of what you do to write faster for you. So you can actually write quicker and more productively. Wow. Um, and the last Imagine thing, if it just wrote all your bullets and all your subheads and all your headlines, you just kind of fill in the middle parts. I mean, yep. it's still a good amount of work, but still it cuts it down to like a quarter of the time or something. Most definitely. And there is one other thing that I really want people to take away from this. Um, we live in a world right now where content is abundant. Like consumption of content is abundant. We have like Netflix, we have Hulu, HBO, all these other places. I hate it when I hear copywriters brag about not watching what is popular. It pisses me off because you are a dumb motherfucker in my opinion and I will call you one to your face. The reason I'll call you a dumb motherfucker, besides the fact that you are, is quite simply this. Game of Thrones, I'm gonna use this as an example. Game of Thrones is one of the highest rated shows of all time. Try getting, uh, try getting anything to go nine years where it has viewer audience uh, viewership of 90% or more. Try it, I guarantee you will fail. Go one year with that, I guarantee you will fail. This show has consistently done so. Do you know what you should do? Watch all of Game of Thrones and have a notepad and pen with you. Start writing down what makes you emotionally feel things. If you don't like the show, ask your friend to take notes for you. 
essentially you want to get the notes on what every big show is doing, why they're doing it in a certain way and what makes them addicted to those things. And I'm using Game of Thrones as an example because I love Game of Thrones. But look at things that are popular that you like. Big Mouth, Rick and Morty, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You name it, see what's going on and see how you can tap into those emotions and then break it down to how you feel and why it makes you feel that way and use those same things in your copy. Case in point, I'm not going to give any spoilers away, but there was a movie last year that made me feel very emotional to the point that I almost cried in the fucking movie theater. Rarely happens, almost did it. What a bitch. I'm just kidding. All right, tell me about it. Now I'm going to get fucking so much hate. I'm going to get like one star. How could you say that? Call him a bitch. He's pouring out his fucking heart. Keep pouring it, bitch. Pouring it. Well, Carlos is my brother, so fuck you guys, whoever wants to give me one star. I'll go back and like ramp up like 10 stars to him. Um, but anyway, so what I'm going to say is like, while I was watching this, what I ended up having, what ended up happening to me was I actually felt like a huge emotional connection to uh, this one character as, you know, things were going down. And I realized, why do I feel this way? And in my mind, I went, it's the father, it's the, it's the father son connection that I'm tapping into that I feel like I was missing. And now I'm actually rebuilding my own personal life. I need to actually explore this on the outside. And that's why I feel the way I do. The next sales I fucking wrote, I somehow weaseled that entire like paradigm in that we were the father, they were the son, and we were helping reach, and reach out to them to reconnect them with that um, natural male dominance. The natural male is mostly for men. So we actually reached out to them in that way. I used the storyline. Guess what? We converted three times higher than the last letter I for them. I wrote wow. Them. Whole reason, whole new emotion, new dynamic, crazy ass work. So yeah, copywriters out there that like to brag, they don't like watching really cool fun shit, go watch really cool fun shit and take your ideas to why you love it. And then you'll be able to like go to a new level. Dude, I love this. You know what I secretly want to do? I'd love to get like you and me and like maybe like 10 other like really badass motherfuckers into a, into a house. And we just do like recordings like this for like five hours and shit and just stream it to people and just give tons of, you know, we should do it in a place where there's legal marijuana, like Colorado. Yeah, for sure. We should do. Or California or Cali. Yeah, but Colorado, you know, I'm not going to hate on Cali. Good, good for Cali, man. Just Colorado. Oh, Colorado's, Colorado's kind of won my heart. <laughs> I, I, I can imagine why Colorado is. It's beautiful there, though, from what I've been told. I, I can't wait to fly out and see it. Yeah, that's right. You're going to be there in a little. Okay, so where where can people uh, find you again? You already said it, but I just say it one, at least one sure. last time. Uh, just guys, you. go to adilamarsi.com. That's A-D-I-L-A-M-A-R-S-I.com. Uh, just find me on there. If you want to follow me on other social media platforms, seriously, I have the easiest name in the fucking world to find. Type my name into Google with your social media platform. It's most likely going to be me. If it has my face on it, it's me. If it has someone else's face on it, not me. I'm really fucking easy to find. And for the folks who, who are just listening, just imagine what he looks like. A very good looking man. Okay. He's a brown so, guy. He's a brown, and a brown guy. Really good hat. <laughs> See, I'm glad you said that. I can't say that. You can say that. Well, you know, it's funny. Somebody made fun of me for saying something about Hispanics. I'm like, dude, my fucking name is Carlos. Are you kidding me? Like, how are you going to get mad at me? Like, Anyways, dude, it's, a, it's an interesting world we're coming to. So it that's really another is. podcast. Thank you so yeah. much, man, for coming on. Everybody who's listening, go check him out. Also, make sure that you, first off, definitely check him out. Follow him on social media. Go to his website. Um, get all his shit and, and, and really get into his inner circle and his tribe and stuff to start really getting all his knowledge. Um, also, while you've been listening, make sure you go, assuming you like this kick-ass content, make sure you like or not like, make sure you uh, rate us five stars and leave us a killer written review so that you know we actually rank up faster on iTunes. We've hit the top 200 level on pod, on the, on iTunes, and we just want to keep on rising to the top. So it's all because of you guys and all because of our awesome guests like uh, like Adil over here. So thank you so much, man. I'll see you Thanks guys on the next episode. See you guys.